it's my true delight and pleasure to be given the opportunity to introduce Victoria Moran. Um, Victoria, many of you may know she runs this uh, radio show and she speaks at many different types of events. And she spoke earlier for us at our Compassion Fest in New Haven. And she's been a guest on our Vegan Spirituality online gathering. So I can say with experience that it is really uh, a gift to have Victoria here. And she is the author of Main Street Vegan and also of her new book, which is called The Good Karma Diet. So we're um, very excited. Without any further ado, I want to give you the, the pleasure to actually listen to Victoria. She has wonderful things to share with us. And so let's give her a warm welcome. Everybody, how was the walk? Great. Very how was nice. the walk? That's nice. good. I didn't go because I don't do nature. Now, <laughs> there are three ways in which humans have accessed spirituality throughout our history. And one way is the nature. And that's actually the first way. When you look at the nature religions, whether we're talking Native American spirituality, shamanism, a Wicca, the Druidic tradition in, in Old Europe. This was, these were nature traditions, and this was how people found meaning in life. And then there's another group of spiritual seekers who find meaning through the self, so going within. So we're looking more in, in the Hindu, Buddhist kinds of traditions, the Taoist tradition, that all truth is within us, and when we go there, there's where we find it. And then there's another way, and that is through history. So most of us probably grew up in, in the Jewish or, or tra uh, Christian tradition. Islam is the same way, Baha'i, where we're looking at history. This happened at this time. This person had this experience. And that is another way to find the sacred. And to me, it is all the most exciting thing in all the world. Anybody else? Why are you at a vegan spirituality retreat? Do you find spirituality about the most exciting thing there is? Mm -hmm. I do. Always have. My first spiritual experience was when I was just under three years old. And I know I wasn't three yet because we moved on my third birthday and this was before we moved. So my nanny, for some reason, took me out late at night probably because my parents were having an argument. I don't know why else I would be out at night, but I was. And I was in a stroller, and it was nighttime, and the sky was filled with stars. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, so although I've lived in New York City for 15 years, I remember stars. And I looked up at the stars and remember thinking, that's home. I'm here now, I'm doing this. Nothing wrong with it, but it ain't home. And I've always had that sense of the more and, and the other. So my childhood and, and adolescence were really punctuated with all this kind of spiritual seeking. And the vegan vegetarian thing was kind of in there even before I started practicing it. I remember coming home from kindergarten having learned the four food groups. And I thought I was really smart, and so I said to this wonderful woman, who she was hired to live with us, because it was before daycare, both of my parents worked. Now what my parents didn't know was they hired a mystic to be my babysitter. Wow. And she was so wonderful. She had studied Rosicrucianism, and, and she knew about theosophy and reincarnation and all these things. So even though I was supposed to be Roman Catholic, I got all the other stuff too. So I came home from school and I told her, you know, that you got the meat milk, the meat group, the dairy group, and the fruit and vegetable group, and the bread and cereal group. She said, well, there are some people who never eat meat. And they're called vegetarians. And I could take you out to eat at Unity Village, the headquarters of the Unity Movement in Missouri, which happens now to sponsor my radio show. Does everything go around and come around or what? She said, I can take you to eat out at Unity Village, and I could get you a hamburger made out of peanuts, and you'd think you were eating meat. And I remember thinking at five years old, oh my gosh, there is so much I don't know. <laughs> and I have a feeling 
I might not learn the best stuff in school. <laughs> so as time progressed and I kept these interests going, I had a Beatles pen pal, Beatles fan club pen pal. <laughs> she was very sophisticated. She lived in Bethesda, Maryland. And I lived in Kansas City, Missouri. So, you know, she was just closer to Europe. And anybody closer to Europe <laughs> was more sophisticated. <laughs> but she asked what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I said, I want to be a mystic. And she wrote back and said, I think you should be a progressive lady theologian, because at least you could study for that in college. Well, I kind of did, so I got a degree in comparative religion, because to me, narrowing it just makes it narrower. So I love the idea of all the ways that people find meaning in life. And yet, on the other hand, if you look at the world in a telescopic way, you get the broad view, but if you look at it in a microscopic way, you get a precise view. So I also have tremendous admiration for people who spend their entire lives simply studying Torah or simply studying one aspect of Buddhism because within the small parts, there's also the whole. It's this wonderful hologram of spirituality. So however you slice it, it's all good. And if you slice it with vegan food and vegan living thrown in, it's even better. So I am going to pass around. This is a little sign-up sheet. If you just give me your first name and your email very, very legibly, there is a handout for this presentation that I will send. Full disclosure, this will also get you on my mailing list, I do a respectfully short weekly little newsletter. It's called the Main Street Minute. That's to remind you how short it's going to be. If you don't want that very instant unsubscribe, if you don't even want to bother with unsubscribe, don't sign. I won't be offended. So, I want to get a sense of who you are. So, let's see. Tell me, who's, who's vegan? Is everybody vegan or, or you know as vegan-ish that it okay that's good you must be tired i'm vegan i want to see happy big 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 vegan yeah you know i know it's after lunch but you know it's not like back when we ate turkey and stuff like that. okay and then i want to get a sense in your life where is your spiritual life tell tell me like on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the best, who's got your spiritual life in 1 to 5? Because you know there's a lot of parts of life. You've got family, you got work, you got health, you blah, blah, blah. 1 to 5 is your spiritual life in 1 to 5. 5 to, one, okay. five to 7. 7 to 10. 10.5. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because you know what? It's the only thing that lasts. And what is so cool as I get older is that I see that, you know, a lot of things, they kind of get older. You get older, stuff is like, yeah, I've done that. The one thing that just keeps renewing and recycling and recreating is the spiritual stuff. It never gets old. It just gets more sparkly. So what I want to talk with you about today is this intersection of veganism and spirituality. Now, some people have trouble with the people in their lives reconciling and allowing for that. Some people have more trouble being vegan within their spiritual community than anywhere else. Has anybody had that problem? I mean, I've seen it in every kind of thing. There's a wonderful phrase from a theologian named Marcus Bach. Marcus Bach is actually famous because of his son. His son wrote a book called Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Very big back in the 1970s. But Marcus Bach had been a Dutch Reformed minister, and he ultimately left that because he said it was just too small. He needed to be what he called a vagabond in the wonderful world of spirit. And that's how I feel. It's just the most wonderful thing. And yet when I dip in to various spiritual traditions and communities, both Eastern and Western, I've sometimes bumped up against, don't bring the vegan stuff into this. Mm -hmm. You know, just, uh, and even in places where you, I mean, okay, you go to your typical Baptist church, Catholic church, I, you don't really expect a lot of warmth for the veganism, so you're nice if they're just okay with it. But you go to a yoga center, you expect they should open, have open 
arms toward your being vegan or certainly vegetarian because it comes right out of that tradition. Well, sometimes it's like that. You go to Jiva Mukti, uh, integral yoga, but very often these days it isn't. I was at a, a yoga center a few years ago, and you know, this is interesting. We, the word karma was mentioned. Karma, it's just such a sweet little thing, because it'll come and get you when you least expect it. So there was a display of books, and it happened that one of the books was a yoga journal anthology of essays, and guess what? I had one in there. So my ego is coming out, and I'm saying to the yoga teacher there, <clears throat> Uh, in, in this book, I have an essay about being vegan. Mm -hmm. And instead of her going, no, I'm so impressed. Oh my gosh, let me touch you. She said, isn't it great that we don't have to be vegetarian anymore now that there's humane meat? Oh, now, oh, God. now that there is humane meat. Oh. But in a yoga center of all the places where I wouldn't expect to get that. But you know what? People get things at different times. Mm -hmm. And what I have to remember every day is that there are people out there living their truth and living their spirituality in ways that I don't get. Mm -hmm. In ways that I have blinders on and I'm just going about my life and maybe they don't have the animal part or the food part, but they've got some other part. And I also have to remember that the people that are doing actively awful things, terrible things to animals, may not be evil. Mm -hmm. They may just be young. I happen to believe that souls evolve. Reincarnation makes sense to me, but that's because I was brought up with it. It doesn't matter what people believe. I'm just sharing something that I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look at children, Sometimes I just think they should take those little people and just stick them in an institution until they're 18 or maybe 21 because they can be so mean and so nasty and they can say things that are so hurtful. Does that mean they're evil? No. It means they're young. And souls can be young too. So I want to know that if somebody is young and doesn't quite get some of the stuff that I've been blessed to get, that there are young parts of me that are not getting stuff either. And that helps. That helps me go out into the world and know that just about all of us are doing the best we can and that if we can shine our light on this vegan thing, more people are going to get this part mm -hmm. too. So what I'd like to share with you is an acronym for the word ahimsa. Now, somebody tell me what ahimsa means. I know you all know. Non-harming, non-violence, non-killing, and as H.J. Dinshaw, the late co-founder of the American Vegan Society, described it, dynamic harmlessness. It's not enough to just like, okay, here I am, eating vegan and not doing a damn thing for anybody else. No, that's not it. You gotta have dynamic harmlessness. So you wanna not harm, and then you wanna actively help. And we wanna actively help, because it would be pretty boring to just sit around and eat kale, and <laughs> let the world go by. So dynamic harmlessness. So this comes from the Sanskrit. Himsa means killing, harming. Ahimsa, non-killing, harming. So I really like acronyms because they're memory tools. And when you get to be my age, I am 65. I came here from Philadelphia for one dollar because I showed my <laughs> Medicare card. <laughs> and it's cool to be vegan and be 65. Mm. Is anybody is anybody as old as me? Who's, who's yes. here? Okay. Isn't it wonderful when you say I want the senior discount and they say prove it? And that is a wonderful opportunity to say. I'm vegan. <laughs> we don't show our age. I had that happen last week um, at Newark Airport. Gorgeous young girl behind the, oh, beautiful, thick, dark, curly hair, beautiful little waist, perky little boobs. <laughs> and I said, I want the senior discount. And she said, you have to be 62. And I said, I'm 65, but I'm vegan, and we don't show our age. <laughs> now, that day, it didn't matter. Because she's young and gorgeous, and she never thinks she's ever going to be older right. than 40. Yeah. But one day, one day, she will wake up, and her flat stomach and her round butt will have taken. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and she will know <laughs> that the gods of youth no longer reside within her to protect her. And she will remember that day, 2015, <laughs> that woman. She said if you're vegan, getting older isn't so bad. Maybe I'll do that. And I've been part of all the animals that she saves, even if I am no longer on the planet when that day comes. Pretty powerful stuff. So you want to use absolutely every excuse that you ever have to carry this message. So here's the acronym, AHIMSA. First, add more to your life than you subtract. H, harm no one, including yourself. I, investigate this way of life. What's here? What do we have to offer? What's in it for us? What's in it for the animals? M. Meditate and move. Essential. We did both of those things today. S. Socialize with other vegans and support other vegans. And A. Something I'm really excited about because I just came up with it. And that is practice attraction activism. And we'll talk in a little bit about exactly what that is. So let's start at the beginning with our first A, and that is add more to your life than you subtract. Now here's what happens. You look in a dictionary. You look up vegan. You hear, oh, there was a woman at the train station. And she said vegan. I don't know what that is. I'm going to look that up. You look up vegan, and it says, a vegan is someone who does not eat meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, and sometimes honey and may not wear leather, wool, fur, blah, 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 blah. And if it really went on, it would talk about all the other things that we do not do. Well, yeah, we don't do them. But do we wake up every day thinking, well, another day of not doing a whole bunch of stuff? <laughs> no, and yet when somebody asks us about it, you know, what's vegan, that's probably what we tell them. Well, you don't do this, you don't do that. You know, they're waiting for you to give them the vow of celibacy. I mean, it really <laughs> seems like a very monastic sort of way of being. But if instead you look at adding more to your life than you subtract and sharing with people that you want to bring over to this way of life how they can add more than they take away, it makes it an entirely different thing. Because to my mind, the definition of veganism needs a total revamp anyway. We need to say veganism is a way of life mm -hmm. based on reverence for all beings and for the earth itself. This is a way of life that through excluding exploitation and celebrating life itself, we create health, harmony, kindness, and a sustainable planet for the future of life on earth. That's veganism. That's a whole lot more than that my shoes aren't leather. It includes that my shoes aren't leather, but it is a whole lot more. No, but the next one. So, you want, and what do you want to add? Well, you want to add all kinds of adventures. So when you're talking to new people, you want to say, oh my gosh, it's so cool. Go to this fancy restaurant. Go to this not fancy restaurant. Try this new fruit and vegetable at the farmer's market. Try this interesting ethnic food. Go online and get yourself a beautiful coat from Vote Good Couture. Get you some great Olsen House boots. I mean, that kind of thing. Add, 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 add. It's lots of fun. But for us, who've been around this a while, what are we going to add? We're going to add lots of nurture. Days like today. How many of you can say that doing something like today, taking a retreat, getting away, just really getting into something lovely for yourself, is something you do really regularly? <laughs> really regularly. You know, at least every three weeks, let's say. Deepak Chopra always says you need a massage every three weeks, every 21 days, if you really want it to help your immunity and that. So who does something like this that often? We need to. You know why? Because we're all the animals have got. And if we're not restored and renewed and taken care of, we'll pity the poor animals 
because we're it. We can't afford to be sad, depressed, down, tired, sick, blah, 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 blah. And sometimes that stuff's going to happen because this is Earth and that's how Earth is. But for the most part, we need to really be energized. We need to be full. So what can you do to recognize yourself? Now, I told you I'm not really into nature, so if I need to recognize myself, I'm not going to go off to the Adirondacks where there's no running water. <laughs> but I might go into a cathedral. I might go to a coffee shop in Soho. And I might look out the window, and I might see, as I have seen, a dog walker in New York City walking 14 dogs. <laughs> or I might see, as I have seen, a man on a unicycle talking on his cell phone and drinking his Starbucks. <laughs> thinking, this is so cool. So what does it for you? Just bring to mind now, what does it for you? What nourishes you? What reinforces you? What reinvigorates you so that you can get out there with renewed energy and renewed commitment for what is most important for you to accomplish on this planet? So add more to your life than you subtract. And then H, harm no one, including yourself. Well, we're pretty good about not harming animals. And we're pretty good about not harming people, although sometimes I think we kind of get on our high horse and we think, well, it's okay if I harm someone who's, who's doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? There's a lot of people who think we're doing stuff wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know what? Let's just pretend, just for a moment, that everybody really is doing the best they can. And let's see what life would be like. You know, there's an old phrase in Christianity, hate the sin but love the sinner. Mm -hmm. My assistant, Danielle, charming young woman, lives near a slaughterhouse in Brooklyn. Tiny little slaughterhouse. We're not talking Tyson chicken. We're talking about this little place. And people work there who are immigrants, probably undocumented, protect them from Donald Trump, <laughs> making <laughs> less than minimum wage. And... Danielle has befriended some of the workers. Now, she is a vegan for a very long time and a very active vegan. She hates the sin, but she has a big enough heart that she can love the sinner. So she said to one of these guys a few weeks ago, my birthday's coming up. And he said, oh, and what do you want for your birthday? She said, well, I'd really like a couple of these chickens. He said, chickens? What do you want with chickens? I would like two chickens. And I would like to take them to an animal sanctuary in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And that would just make me have a really happy birthday. Mm -hmm. Well, now this isn't like the foreman. This is just a guy. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll get you one chicken on your birthday. And I'll get you another chicken the next week. <laughs> and Danielle said, that works. Now. It's a tiny little thing. It's two chickens. They're killing hundreds of chickens every day. Mm -hmm. And we know that the way chickens are killed is nothing anybody wants to mm -hmm. ponder. So two little lives. Two little lives out of all that. Mm -hmm. Is that all? Uh -uh. No. It's two lives, and that's a lot to those lives. Mm -hmm. But there's also a man working there who knows somebody believes those lives have value. Mm -hmm. Now, many religious traditions would say we have value because God, by whatever word you want to use, knows us and sees us and values us. On this earth, oftentimes, we forget that and we need to have other people saying to us, I know you, I see you, I value you. Well, what this man at the slaughterhouse saw was that a lovely young woman, energetic, pretty, very much involved in life, values the life of a chicken. He never knew anybody ever in his life that valued the life of a chicken. And now he does. Does that mean he's going to stop working at a slaughterhouse? Probably not. He probably doesn't have any options. But somehow in his mind and in his soul, that seed has been planted. And you just never know what's going to happen with seeds. You know? Sometimes they're like zucchini. And they just grow and grow and grow. So harm no one, including yourself. 
Now, how do we not harm ourselves? Well, we want to feed ourselves. We want to get these places that show us ourselves, these places where we recognize ourselves. And you also want to take really, really good care of this physical body. You know, sometimes when people are into spiritual stuff, we kind of deny this. It's like, this is, this is, some traditions will say, this is the gross physical, this is heavy. Well, yeah, it's heavy, but it's what we've got. So one of the traditions that I absolutely love for feeling really, really healthy, and I invite you to study up on it if you want a kind of enlightened way of looking at your own health, and that is Ayurveda. Who's looked into Ayurveda? The um, Indian tradition. It grew up alongside yoga, so we're talking very ancient traditions. They may go back as far as 6,000 years. We know for sure they go back 4,000 years. So in Ayurveda, it's the idea of being in balance with yourself and with the flow of nature. If you want to look more into this, Deepak Chopra's very first book, Perfect Health, is superb. I've probably read it 20 times, and I can't say that about a lot of books. Now, Ayurveda is not a vegan tradition. It leans vegetarian, but because it's Indian, there's a lot of milk and clarified butter. But there is a wonderful cookbook called The Ayurvedic Vegan Kitchen that makes all the recipes vegan so you don't have to do any translations. But the gift from Ayurveda that I want to share with you today is what they call Dhyancharya, or daily routine. The belief is that not only do we have these biorhythms, but that everything in nature has rhythms. That there's a cycle through the day, there's a cycle through the season, and there's a cycle through our lives. And if, the, if we can be in tune with those cycles, then we're going to be healthier and we're going to be more content. So let's just take the day. We're going to get up in the morning and we're going to get up at 6 o'clock. How many people just went, ah, inside when I said 6 o'clock? Yeah. We have this idea at this time in history that some of us are night people. Well, that is absolutely patently absurd. Because if you lived before Edison and you thought you were a night person, you would have tripped over the furniture. Our species is designed to be up and active when the sun is up and to be asleep when there's no light. There are other species who are different. Do you know any cats? Possums? There are lots of creatures who are designed to be nocturnal. We're not among them. In Ayurveda, it's taught that right around 6, any time really between 5 and 7, there's a kind of wake-up energy in the universe. And if you get up at that time, that wake-up energy is going to be with you, and it's going to help you wake up. But if you push snooze, mm -hmm. and you kind of stay in 7.30, quarter to 8, 8 o'clock, 9, you're not going to want to get up till 10.30. <coughs> but if you can train yourself to get to bed by 10, 9.30, 11, 10 is really good. Then there's go to sleep energies, and you'll sleep long enough, and you'll get up, and you'll feel good. So you get up, and then you want to start helping your body detox right away. Detox is such a buzzword, and we think it means go off and drink juice for a week, and you can do that. But some little simple things you can do every day is simply to support those organs of the body that are designed to detoxify. So you go into the bathroom, and you scrape your tongue. You can get a little simple silver tongue scraper at most drugstores, health food stores, and you don't scrape like you're going to hurt yourself, but just very gently to remove that little coating on your tongue. In Ayurveda, they call that ama, and it means metabolic debris. It builds up over, over the night. Has anybody fasted or juice fasted and noticed what goes on in your tongue when you do that? I mean, it's like... Good Lord, who's been in my mouth? It, it just that little tiny coating that you might get in an ordinary morning just exponentially increases because your body is saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're finally giving me a chance to get rid of some of this stuff. So you do that, and then you also want to have a nice cup of warm water, warm to hot water with a little lemon in it. 
If actual lemon juice frightens you because of your tooth enamel, you can use edible essential oils like a Young Living oil, a couple of drops in water. And what this will do, one thing is it will train your body to have a bowel movement in the morning, which is another kind of, of detox. And it's also going to alkalinize your system because of the lemon. It's going to hydrate you. You've been asleep for a long time. You haven't had any kind of, of liquid. And that's going to be a good thing for starting your day. Then you also want to do some yoga. We did some yoga today, which was wonderful. You don't have to do an hour. You don't have to sweat. You just want to do enough gentle stretches and bends that your body knows that it's daytime. In yoga, it's said that you are as young as your spine. When your spine is flexible, you're going to be doing well. Even five, ten minutes. Because one day in every life, it comes. You get out of bed. And something happens. Mm -hmm. And something stiff. And you think, wait a minute. That's not supposed to happen for 15 years. Mm -hmm. But it just happened. Well, you know what? Chances are you went to bed stiff. You went to bed tense. Maybe you watched the news or the debates. Mm -hmm. And you went to bed like this. <laughs> and then you wonder why you didn't get up feeling like this. Well, you do some stretches. I like the idea of putting your yoga mat out by the bed in the evening. Do a few stretches, and then when you get up in the morning, it's very easy. Do a few more, and then you meditate. And we're going to get to that in a minute, because that's going to be one of our uh, little acronym words. Then you want to have breakfast. You want to have some kind of breakfast. What kind? I don't know. It depends on you. Now, the one thing centenarians all have in common is they all eat breakfast. They might eat all different kind of food, but they eat breakfast. Now, some people say, oh, I don't want a lot of breakfast. I can't face food in the morning. That's fine. Have a wonderful juice, a wonderful fresh green juice. And if you're somebody who has a problem with junk food and you get up in the morning and you really want a vegan donut, have juice first. Because when you drink juice, green juice or even carrot and beet and some of those others, but mostly green juice, it changes you at the desire level. It changes you at a cellular level, so what you want to eat for the rest of the day is different. And then maybe you're a smoothie person, maybe you're a muesli person, maybe you're an oatmeal person, maybe you just want some fresh fruit. Doesn't matter, have a little something for breakfast. And then, according to Ayurveda, you want your big meal in the middle of the day. And that's so difficult for most people, working the way most of us work. But if you just take a little bit of the teaching and at least sit down, for your meal in the middle of the day. At least leave your desk. Have you all seen the ad? I think it's for a car. And it says, when did leaving the office on time become an act of courage? <laughs> I think that is the coolest commercial that's been on TV in years. Because it really has become an act of courage for people to say, look, I work. I work hard. I am not here to do nothing but work for the man, as it were. So take that time in the middle of the day. And if you happen to be fortunate enough to have your own hours and be able to really have your large meal in the middle of the day, here's what it's going to do for you. Your digestive fire, which in Ayurveda is called Agni, is hottest at high noon. And that's high noon by the sun, not by daylight savings time. Mm. And that's when you're going to deal best with food. Now, a lot of people have digestive difficulties. A lot of young people, a lot of young women in their 20s, they're just agonized with IBS and all these other kinds of things. That's not how it's supposed to be. We not only don't know what to eat, we don't know how to eat. Do you know how people used to eat, even in this country, nothing about Ayurveda? Breakfast, that was a decent meal to break the fast. Dinner, in the middle of the day, big meal. Supper. Supper came from the same word as supplement. Supper was this little thing to supplement what you'd already eaten. Just a little thing, a little something, so you don't get hungry in the night. But you don't want to have a great big meal in your stomach and then go to sleep because your body is supposed to be detoxifying during the night. So however sizable your dinner is, you want to have it at least three hours before you go to bed so that it's digested, and then when you go to sleep, your body can do the cleansing and the healing because it's going to digest first. And if it has to digest, then cleansing and healing get put off. 
and then we wonder why things get so not so hot. So, before dinner, can you do another meditation? We'll talk about that when we get to meditation. And then you want to go to bed by 10, but by 9, you want to start winding down. So you want to not be having discussions about things that are difficult. You don't want to be online looking at animal cruelty. You want to be winding down in that last hour. And then you want to go to sleep in a bedroom that is dark and quiet. And if you don't live in a studio apartment in New York City and you don't have to have your computer and your exercise bike and everything else in your bedroom, don't have it there because that is all activity. And you want to be thinking about repose. So this just gives you an idea of a day in which you treat yourself like a piece of porcelain, in which you treat yourself like someone who matters, in which you treat yourself like an animal who deserves not to have someone being cruel to him or to her. That's H. Do not harm anyone, including yourself. I is investigate, and this is one of my favorites. So when we're talking to new people, fresh vegans, we want them to investigate what this way of life is about and what they need to do to make it successful. So in their case, they need to know how to answer where do you get your protein. They need to know about B12. They need to know what to say when somebody says, but what's wrong with milk? You don't have to kill the cow to get the milk. All that stuff they need to learn, and we can help them gently and, and kindly get that information. If we don't have all the answers, we can lead them to where they can get them. But we need to investigate too. And I believe that what we need to investigate most is where we came from as vegans and vegetarians. Now, I run a program called Main Street Vegan Academy, which is just a glorious adventure, five and a half days. And at the end of it, people are certified as vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. And they go out into the world, and they start businesses, and they make money, and they make vegans and save animals. It's so fabulous. But when they come, we do something every morning called Veg Trivia. And we play a little game and ask some questions about different aspects of veganism. And it's fun, and it helps people have a chance to talk. But it also tells me kind of where people are at. We have done 13 classes so far. We're about to have our 14th class in early October. And what I've learned in all these 13 experiences is that people who are really dedicated vegans tend to know everything about food. We are these food geniuses. <laughs> and we know a lot about nutrition. It's amazing how well we've done our homework. We're very good on that. I think that if you wanted to go into a hospital and impersonate a registered dietitian, <laughs> you'd probably last two, three years before anybody would find out, because we know a lot. We know a lot about what goes on with animals, maybe more than our hearts need to be carrying around. We know that. And we know about the environment. Maybe not all the parts per million, but we've got the general idea. Do you know what most of us know almost nothing about? Our history, where we came from. I get people coming to the academy and say, where did the word vegan come from? And they'll say, uh, PETA? We need to know this stuff because it goes way, way back. And that gives us a philosophy on which to base everything. There was an article in uh, one of the online papers just yesterday about a new restaurant in New York City, which does look, look fabulous. It's called um, Avant Garden. And I mean, very upscale, very beautiful. It was in Zagat. That was who it was. And Zagat said, entering the trendy fray of vegan fare. And it's like, oh. don't call us a trendy fray. But out there in the world, it's trendy, right? <laughs> but where are we going to be when the trend is somewhere else? Well, if we've got our history, if we've got our foundation, we're going to be exactly where we need to be. So some of the very exciting things about our history is to go back and see where we came from. And I'm drawing on the spirit now of Rin Berry. Who knew Rin Berry? The historian of the vegan vegetarian movement he passed away last year prematurely, rest his soul. I guess he had more to do on the other side than down here. But 
he taught so much of this stuff. He actually has a couple of great books if you're interested. One is called Food for the Gods, which is vegetarianism and the world's religions. Another one is Famous Vegetarians and Their Favorite Recipes, where he took from the writings of people like Da Vinci and, and Tagore and, and others what may have been their favorite recipes. It's this fun book. But anyway, these are some of the things that I learned from Ren and that we all need to know. Let's start in the beginning. Lots of the people that we're going to be talking with are going to be Jews and Christians. So this is their culture. What does the Bible say about what we're supposed to eat? In the beginning, Genesis 1.29, God says, Behold! And biblical scholars tell me very seldom did God ever say, Behold! with an exclamation mark. <laughs> but he says, Behold! In other words, what I'm going to say now is important. Behold, I give you every herb bearing seed, and the seed that is within the fruit to you it shall be for me. What does that mean? That meant that in Eden, there were no carnivores. The animals ate the grasses and the grains. Adam and Eve were given the fruits and the nuts and the fruit-like vegetables. Interesting. If you've ever gone to Hawaii or Costa Rica and you've hung out with raw fooders and some of the ones who get very kind of mystical and they're like, yeah, man, I don't eat anything that dies. I only eat what you can pick off the tree and then you just throw out the seed and then it makes another tree. <laughs> well, in the Genesis story, that was how it was. And you know what's really interesting? After the fall, whether you take this literally or just as, as a poem with a lot of wisdom behind it, after the fall, when death and pain and labor came into life, God said, you guys better have the green leafy vegetables. Those were reserved before just for the animals. Well, we know that the most nutritionally dense foods on the planet are those leafy greens. If you're living in the garden of paradise and you're never going to die, eat fruits and nuts. But if you're living on earth, you better add some leafy greens. Interesting, interesting stuff. And then, of course, the flood came and God said, okay, because there's no vegetation, you can eat meat. And that's where there's a split. So Jews and Christians who are vegetarians say that was temporary. And Jews and Christians who eat meat say, no, it's time for, you know, the flesh pots. So there is a split there, but it's so fascinating to know that throughout Western history, most of the vegetarian vegan teachings have come through religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Vegan spirituality, when Lisa started it, was a very new thing, very avant-garde. And yet up until about hmm, 1930, Virtually all the vegetarianism that had come into the Western world came through religious and spiritual teachers. So that's what's going on over in Palestine. Now we're going to go to India. About the same time, way, way back, or maybe a little bit further if we're going to put Genesis way, way back. But a long time ago from where we sit, we have this golden age of India. We have these brilliant teachers in yoga, in Ayurveda. They brought the Vedas through history and oral tradition. And they have a tremendous wisdom. In yoga, they were looking for the ideal diet. The yogis were the first nutritionists. So they were looking at people who were going to meditate for long periods and become enlightened. So we're talking not 30 minutes with Lisa. We're talking hours and hours and hours a day with the idea of I want to cut my incarnation short and I want to get enlightened in short order. So what am I going to do? How am I going to move? How am I going to live so that I can do that? So they said, well, let's see. If you're eating a lot of food that is old and stale, so things like aged cheeses, alcoholic beverages, Meat, meat has to be old before you can eat it because it's kind of you've got the rigor mortis thing and it's got to soften up again and all that. Those foods are what the yogis call tamasic and they keep you from wanting to explore higher things and they make you really tired and really sleepy and you know 
it would just be really hard to meditate. Oh. But on the other side, we've got some other foods, and we call those rajasic. And our very favorite rajasic food is coffee, coffee, coffee. And if you live in a country where they don't drink coffee, then they make their tea really, really, really strong so that you can get pumped up, pumped up. And what else will pump you up? Well, 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 you can get pumped up with eggs. You can get pumped up with fiery, fiery spices. You can get pumped up with fried fruits, fried fruits, fried fruits. Woo! Okay. You're eating those tamasic foods? You're going to fall asleep during meditation. You're eating the rajasic foods. You can't sit still for meditation. So the yogi said, here in the middle, there are these beautiful foods called sattvic. And these foods are fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and a couple of foods that we may not be partaking of. And one is raw honey. And that always from the vegan society in the UK was left to individual conscience. And the yogis also said milk from healthy cows, which certainly we're not going to eat as vegans today. But you know what? I don't know if you could find a healthy cow today. And certainly today, there's no karma-free milk. I don't know what it was like 4,000 years ago in India, but I know what it's like today. There's no karma-free milk. But other than that, look at that list of foods and compare it to the kinds of foods that are plant-based nutritionists are telling us we ought to be eating today. Those yogis were very, very far-sighted. So this came through these ahimsa religions, partly for the health benefits, the pro-meditation benefits, but also because of this word we're talking about, ahimsa, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. Now, Jainism is the only religion on the planet that actually requires vegetarianism of its members, but that, that source of ahimsa is in the others as well. And Rin used to tell a wonderful story that in the ahimsa religions, there are commandments, just like Jews and Christians have the Ten Commandments. They're just slightly different commandments. And the very first one is ahimsa, and it's the most important so much more important than the, than the others that Rin would say, if you were out in the woods and you saw the deer go that away, and the hunter comes by and says, which way did the deer go? You can say, that way. <laughs> Completely ignore the commandment about not lying because ahimsa is more important. Now, if the hunter looks away and you have a chance to filch his bow or his arrows, mm -hmm. you could do that too. You could ignore the commandment against stealing because ahimsa is more important. And if you really had to, you could ignore the commandment calling for sexual purity. You could seduce the hunter, and that would distract him so that he wouldn't kill the deer. This is how important ahimsa is. It comes over everything else. So these ideas, even when imperfectly practiced went into the Indian culture and as Buddhism and, and some of these other ideas went out into the broader world, ahimsa, to a small extent at least, came with them. Now, let's go back to the West and let's stay back in antiquity. We're going to be at about 340 BC and a baby is born who was so brilliant. We're talking ancient Greece and we're talking Pythagoras, the guy with the theorem. Now, everybody knows, yeah, Pythagoras, he had that geometry thing. <laughs> Pythagoras was one of the most brilliant philosophers and mathematicians, not just of the ancient world, but of all time. Pythagoras said that the universe is composed of precise mathematical calculations. Do I understand that? Not on your life, but it sounds so good. Pythagoras came up with the musical scale. So whether you're listening to Beethoven or, or the Beatles, or it all came from Pythagoras. Now Pythagoras was what we would call today a raw food vegan. He called it an unfired diet. And if you wanted to come to him and be one of his students in mathematics and philosophy, he would say, okay, but first you have to do a 40-day fast, and we're talking water, not carrot, celery, and grapefruit, 
and you have to go on a raw vegan diet afterwards. Why? Because people who don't eat in this way or who haven't purified in this way do not, in Pythagoras' opinion, have the mental capacity to take in these advanced ideas that he's trying to teach. Now, Pythagoras was also, talk about a Renaissance man way before the Renaissance, an athletic coach. And one of his best students was a guy called Milo of Croton. Has anybody heard of Milo of Croton? See, we've all heard of Rich Roll. But Milo of Croton was a wrestler. He also had a brilliant military record. But as a wrestler, he won the gold in six Olympiads. So he was not a young guy, and he was still wrestling, and Pythagoras was his coach. So until 1850, when the word vegetarian was coined, people who didn't eat meat were called Pythagoreans. Mm -hmm. There's a young man in New York City named Michael Parrish Studell. He's one of our instructors at Main Street Vegan Academy. And he's a business guy. I mean, he's actually tapped by the Shark Tank show to write their business book. And he has a tattoo right here, and it says Pythagorean, because that's what we used to call vegetarians. And he is, of course, a vegan, as was Pythagoras. We just didn't have the word vegan. So I'm going to skip all the middle time, even though this is so fascinating. I love this topic. But in the 1600s, the English went to India. They went first, not as colonizers, just as commercial people, and then they did the whole empire deal. And if you go to India today, you see so much England. It's just like they just left last week. But it didn't just go one way. It went two ways. So some of these ideas about yoga, about reincarnation, about master teachers, about gurus, all these things started getting to England. And along with that came vegetarianism, came ahimsa. And English people started writing about it. And then anybody who could read English had access to it. And then we had our big upsurge in the whole vegetarian thing in the 1800s. There were lots of Christian churches. There was something called the Bible Christian Church, huge in England, pretty big in the US, actually right here in um, in Pennsylvania, a big uh, Bible Christian church uh, community, all vegetarian. We know the Seventh-day Adventists have pretty much stuck with it. About half of Adventists are vegetarian. They use them for all the studies because they can look at the vegetarians and then the vegans and the meat eaters, and they live similarly in every other way. And we can see what happens health-wise when people, maybe they don't drink, they don't smoke, they go to bed early. Some of them eat meat, some of them eat eggs and dairy, some of them eat only vegetables. And you know what we see in virtually every instance. There was one little thing where the lacto-ovos were better in one tiny little thing than the vegans. But in every other case, if you look at the Adventist 2 Health Study, the vegans are far and away the healthiest. So we have a brilliant, brilliant history investigated. And meditation and movement, you got to do it. My favorite meditation study says that people who have meditated regularly for five years or, or more are 12 years younger physiologically than people who don't meditate. Subtract 12 from your current age. It's a lot. Might put somebody back in high school. But for any of us, that's a lot. You add seven years to your life if you quit smoking. You get 12 years if you sit quietly for 20 minutes twice a day. It's hard to do it twice a day. But if you can get that evening meditation in, that kind of before dinner time, just stay at your office and do it or do it when you first get home, it gives you your evening. Do you ever get the thing, oh my god, it's so, oh, what a long day. You meditate and then you get the evening back. Maybe to do some more animal work, maybe to take care of yourself. Meditation, movement, you gotta move the body. I love what you said about resting. We don't want it to rest. S, socialize and support. We need one another. So get together, get in your vegan spirituality group, get in your meetup group, get online, get for real. We really need each other. We don't need to be preaching to each other. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do out in the world. But we need to be supporting each other because it's not easy. And so often people will say, well, I was vegan, but I felt tired. Well, if you ask a couple of leading questions, they weren't that tired. They got a new boyfriend 
Where they were afraid they were never going to get a new boyfriend unless they stopped being vegan. I mean, there are real serious life things that go on when you choose to be a minority. So we need to support each other. So, so important. And finally, A, in the beautiful word ahimsa, that is attraction activism. So what do I mean by that? I mean becoming someone who, as you live your life, makes other people want to be vegan, makes other people want to care about animals. Now, I actually stole this from Alcoholics Anonymous. You have never been out at a bar having a nice time and some guy from AA thrusts a tract in your face saying don't drink. Never, never. That doesn't happen. That's not how they have been successful for 80 years. What AA says is we are going to get people by attraction rather than promotion. If you have something that somebody else wants, they're going to do what you did to get it. That's why we need to be healthy. That's why we need to be nice, even to people who are doing things we don't approve of. That's why we need to be exemplary. Why should we have to be exemplary? We're doing the right thing. It's because there are more of the other people. When we get to be the majority, you know, maybe it's different. <laughs> right now, we are the minority, and we just need to be like little Sunday school girls. We need to be just so bright and sparkly so that everybody wants what we've got. And the way you can do this is just take every opportunity. So if somebody says to you, you just have the calmest disposition. You say, you know what? Everything used to irritate me. But now that I'm vegan, I don't know. <laughs> the world, you know, things are, are just better. You know, oh, you know, your children are just so well behaved. You know, they were just hyperactive as hell <laughs> until I got them off the junk food and the animal foods. And now, they're just, I mean, whatever it is, you find a way. I went to Moose Shoes, our wonderful vegan shoe store in New York City, when a friend was visiting. And there were these unbelievably fabulous boots. I mean, there were these <clears throat> ultra suede, over the knee, ultra suede, fabulous, fabulous, inky, jet black boots with wedge heels. And if you fold over the cuff, periwinkle blue. <laughs> <laughs> but they were a lot of money, more than I would generally spend on my lower extremities. And so, you know. I don't, got in Subway, started going home, and God spoke to me, because I can say that, this is a spiritual gathering, and, and God said, Victoria, and I said yes, and God said, you are almost too old for black, ultra suede, over the knee boots, almost, not quite, act while there is still time. <laughs> so, I went back the next day, and I got the boots, and they are such a tool for vegan activism. I could be blindfolded and know exactly what part of New York City I was in, because if I am wearing those boots and I hear, fabulous boots, I know I'm on the Upper East Side. And if I hear, wow, those are amazing boots, I know I'm in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And if I hear, whoa, mama, I know I'm in my neighborhood, Harlem. And wherever I am, and I get one of those compliments, I say, thank you, and they're vegan. I love the word vegan. Love the word vegan. James McWilliams, wonderful professor down in Texas, wrote Just Food, says vegan is a very hopeful term. Some people don't like it. They say other things. I don't care for plant-based because it doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. If I say to you, uh, my neighbor's kids go to a math-based school, <laughs> you wouldn't say, well, that's terrible. They don't get any English or history or gym. <laughs> you would know. It's mostly math, but they get all the other stuff. Well, if I say I eat a plant-based diet, like a friend of mine who says, oh, I just feel so much better. I eat 60% plant-based, so much better. <sighs> mm -hmm. I like vegan, you know? Mm -hmm. Shoot me. I like vegan. I like being vegan. I like what it's done for me, and more than that, I like what it does for my connection to the other beings, to other people, because you know what? Even people who aren't vegan, and people who don't want to be vegan, and people who used to be vegan, I do have a problem with people who used to be vegan. I'm working on that. <laughs> but it softens my heart, and that's what we need. You know, we work to have these hard bodies, but we also need 
soft hearts. Mm -hmm. This is such a gift, and we are so, so fortunate to have been given it. Thank you. Bless you. And you, because my dog would be barking like crazy in the sound of applause. We have a, a new rule now at Main Street Vegan Academy. After somebody speaks, we have to do this. <laughs> because little Forbes does not like applause. So I'm going to tell you about what I have up here, and then we'll take a couple of questions. Is that okay? All right. So um, let's see. I'll just start from the beginning. This is actually the 2009 edition of a book I originally wrote in 1992. I've been at this a while. This is The Love Powered Diet. It is about recovery from compulsive overeating. I've maintained a 65 pound weight loss for 31 years based on what's in this book. The first half is about spiritual recovery. The second half is about being vegan. This is Shelter for the Spirit. It was my first Oprah book. I have been on Oprah twice, and I just miss terribly that she has a network and not a show, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is Shelter for the Spirit, and it's about making your home nourish your soul. So if you're kind of a homebody, or you've moved, or you're newly married, or something like that, you might like that. This is my classic, Creating a Charmed Life. It's everybody's favorite. It's in 30 languages around the world. People say to me, I love all your books, but that Charmed Life, that's a blessed book. And I know it's true. This one came through me instead of from me. Um, this is Main Street Vegan. This is actually another blessed book. This is kind of a miracle. I went to a PETA fundraiser, and I, all I wanted, with all my heart after seeing some of that footage, was write this woman a check for $100,000. Mm -hmm. But it would have bounced, so I had to do something else. So I'm in the subway where God seems to always talk to me, and this time he said, okay, you don't have 100000 but here's what you can do. Your next book needs to be called Main Street Vegan, 40 Little Chapters, a recipe at the end of each one, geared to that young woman in Illinois that you were in 1983 when you finally took the plunge and did this. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and then we got the publisher, and as soon as everything was signed, they said, we're so happy to have you. We're so happy to have the book. Oh, by the way, we hate Main Street. It sounds like the Tea Party. And I'm thinking, well, you know, let's get all them. But no, they didn't want this. So I tried to write it with a different title, and it just was not happening. And so a miracle happened, a vegan miracle. Who's had a vegan miracle? Please. I mean, I've had a couple. We'll look for them. So my husband and I are walking up Broadway, and there is Michael Moore, the filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I knew that he had lost some weight at some point in the past with one of my other books. So I just handed my card to the woman who was with him and said, just tell him hello. Fifteen seconds later, I hear, Victoria! Following us up Main Street is Michael Moore. He says, we need to talk. We need to talk about food. So we talked, and then he said, I'm going to Michigan. When I come back in a month, I'll call you. And I thought, of course you will. <laughs> People with Academy Awards call me all. <laughs> <laughs> but miraculously, he did, and we started talking. And on one of these talks, I mentioned that my book was supposed to be called Main Street Vegan, and they didn't like Main Street. He said, they are wrong. He said, it's a perfect title because everybody thinks Whole Food Street Vegan or Hippie Street Vegan. <laughs> he said, let me talk to them. So there was a three-way call with Michael Moore, my editor, and me. I got my title, and this has spawned Main Street Vegan Academy, the Main Street Vegan Podcast, Main Street Ve Vegan Productions. We're working on a feature film about a cow who escapes from a slaughterhouse. So if you don't believe in vegan miracles, start. And this is my latest. This is the Good Karma Diet, a little more spiritual. You know, any kind of vegan diet is a good karma diet. You put that kind of good out into the world, it's going to come back. But if you want some right here and now kind of great karma, you want to kind of up that nutritional life force element a bit so that you get some more of that vitality and that youthfulness and that glow. And that's what we talk about in here. We get into the kind of the high green and the high raw and the smoothies and the here's and what's it and it's really fun, and there's a wonderful recipe section in the back written by one of our brilliant young uh, vegan chefs, Doris Finn from Toronto. This is the Main Street Vegan Podcast. 
We're live every Wednesday afternoon, and because it's a podcast, it lives forever on the magical internet. And here is information about Main Street Vegan Academy if you want to uh, bring your veganism to the next level and go out there and do amazing things. We have uh, one of our students has a very successful ice cream company in Toronto. Another one has a vegan cowboy boot company. I don't know if anybody saw the picture yesterday. I got my vegan cowboy boots yesterday. They are so jazzy. And let's see, somebody else is opening a vegan cheese shop in Brooklyn at the end of the year. And a couple who went through the course are opening a um, convenience store, a vegan, like a vegan 7-Eleven in Philadelphia. Uh, early in 2016. So you get certified as a vegan lifestyle coach and educator, but you get inspired to do all these other things. So who knows what you might do. So, a couple of questions? Sure. Okay. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, you should have a TED Talk. Yes. I would love to have a TED Talk. You, you help me figure out how to do that. I actually applied for TEDx in New York City, which was about food. But you know, they were these people that are into the kind of locavore thing. And I mean, I would rather go up against Tyson Chicken than those locavore people, because they don't like vegans at all. Yeah. Mm. But if you know anything that I don't know, I would love to do that. Okay, Thank great. you. But I do have a question. Yes. Uh, do you travel worldwide? Mm -hmm. Uh, trends. Do you see, uh, I think like in Germany, veganism is very popular, mm -hmm. very growing, and probably Europe itself as mm -hmm. well. But when you travel around the world, do you see this movement like gaining a foothold? Uh, yes. Oh, like in India, it's more prevalent. But well, in India, it's prevalent, but India is a problem. India and China are both increasing their meat consumption because of, of the, their prosperity, and they both have these tremendous populations. So that is a problem. And I think one of the things we need to do in this country is stay cool. I mean, as long as we're the lifestyle leaders, which we have been for several decades, and everybody wants what we do, they want all the McDonald's because that's what we did. So if we do this other thing, maybe we can hold on long enough that they'll want that. But there are other pockets in the world. You mentioned Germany. Germany has this um, supermarket yeah. called <laughs> Wiegand's, and all the five top uh, population cities in Germany have a Wiegand's. It's not quite as big as, as most Whole Foods, but it's really big, and it's all vegan. Wonderful uh, magazine, Welt Vegan World. Welt vegan, world vegan. Um, so that's good. Israel is the fastest growing country on the planet for veganism, largely dating back to this Gary Yarovsky mm -hmm. talk that somebody translated into Hebrew. And the the growth in, in vegan restaurants, they have the biggest uh, vegan festival in the world. And my favorite thing is that if you're in the Israeli army, which of course is mandatory, everybody has to go through that, but if you're vegan, you get an extra $125 a month stipend wow. for uh, extra food that you might need. And you can also requisition for vegan army boots. Uh, and some of the other places, uh, Iceland, very interesting. In Iceland and also in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, there is a lot in the raw food movement, which is so interesting because you think of raw food in tropical countries. It was like, why would anybody in Iceland or Russia want to be a raw foodist? And I think part of it is because Anne Wigmore, who was really big in the raw thing, came from Lithuania. And so they figure there's some kind of, of, of roots there. So there's a lot in that part of the world. And then England, of course, where the, the first vegetarian society in the West started in 1842, um, in uh, the Vegan Society, 1944. So that's really the birthplace of modern Western vegetarianism, veganism. Very big. Um, VegFest UK has four huge festivals every year. Tons and tons of restaurants. I'm actually going over um, in October. And in fact, on my last podcast, I had a, a little uh, mini visit from somebody from, from VegFest UK. And one of the exciting things that he shared, I mean, I know that we have our wonderful New Jersey senator who's vegan. That's great. They have more than one member of parliament who's vegan. But they talked about one woman who comes from Bristol. And she has been been promoted to something they call the shadow cabinet. It's like if you're not of the, the primary um, ruling party, but you're in the other party, and they call you shadow, whatever. But anyway, she's in charge of the agriculture of this, and she's a vegan. And what he said was, 
the farmers will listen to her because she's not just saying, stop raising pigs or whatever. She's saying, let's look at your farm. What could you do that's an alternative? Very, very exciting stuff around the world, and I'd love to see more of it. <laughs> Somebody else? Yes. So right in the beginning, you were talking about how sometimes there is a big disconnect between whatever your religious group is and veganism. Why do you think that is, and what do you think we should do? Like, what are, what, what are your thoughts on that? Can you talk about that part of it? Yeah. Bit? Well, I think the attraction activism is just huge. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I think when people are religious, they're basically looking to see others put forth that ethic in the world. And... Sometimes people admire you when you do something that they can't. We were talking at lunch about when I traveled in Tibet in the 90s, and, and these are Buddhists, and they know about what Buddha said about nonviolence and vegetarianism, but they happen to live in a climate where it's just really hard to grow anything. And yet when they found out that my, my boyfriend and my daughter and I were vegan, they would make us these wonderful spreads and then they would leave and we would eat by ourselves. And I thought, what is going on? And it was explained to me later, oh, they think you're so holy. They think you're like some kind of, you know, super spiritual beings that don't want to, you know, defile yourself by eating with mere mortals because we were vegan. So I think sometimes people admire you even if they don't say so. Mm -hmm. oh. And I think it's just a matter of being there for them and caring for them and loving them. Because, you know, we get this thing sometimes if you guys only care about animals, mm -hmm. which is just utterly yes. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yes. And very often the people that say that, you know, well, why do you do this work for animals? And you say, right. well, what work do you do? Right. No. Well, I'm busy. Yeah. You know? right. <laughs> right. 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 And so um, I think just, just be sweet. And the other thing, and the thing that is so cool, and the best thing about staying with this and having birthdays, is the longer you live, and the longer you're healthy, and everybody else starts falling like flies. <laughs> I mean, you know what goes on in, in, in this world. People get sick, people get on all these medications, and you show up and you're just having a conversation, and you know somebody's talking about their, you know, their cholesterol medication, and their blood pressure medication, and their diabetes medication, and their blah, blah, blah medication, and you're like, not on any you're not on any medication there's a, a woman I know in, in New Jersey who's a raw vegan wonderful woman in her 70s she had a little skin thing and she went into a dermatologist and the woman walked into the room carrying her chart put the chart down on the table and said this is ridiculous a woman your age ought to be on some medication <laughs> my friend said for what you know, you got to have something wrong with you. And I think when you can be remarkable, we love remarkable in this country. Whether we're talking about religious people, other people. What was one of the biggest TV shows watched last week? The finale of America's Ninja Warrior. This is a country of couch potatoes. Nobody takes a walk, but we want to see these people doing these extraordinary feats. So being healthy as you proceed in life is an extraordinary feat. Being content, being fulfilled, I think it's really being an example. about all, being an example. And if somebody asks, mm -hmm. you know, then you can tell them. And you can tell them, like if you're Jewish, there's this wonderful documentary from Jewish Vegetarians of North America. Does anybody know the name of that off, mm -hmm. offhand? No, I was just that. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful film for anybody of any face. But yeah, but sacred, sacred duty? Sacred duty, duty. yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and certainly, you know, with, with Christians, you can pull out all this history. I mean, the early church fathers, uh, Clement of Alexandria, mm -hmm. all these people were, did this. And if you've got people with a little bit of an open mind, you can talk. But if they don't have an open mind and you talk, then they just think you're being pushy. So I think it's more about shining your light. Yeah.